that one. Okay. We are live. Morning friends, Tim Booth from the Jackson Chamber. Just gonna wait just another minute or so, we'll get going. I've got 11.02. We're still seeing some participants join us here. So we'll kick this thing off here in just a minute. Thank you for uh, participating. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar with Sarah Leitner. It's great to have you here. Uh, my name is Tim Booth. I am events and legislative affairs here with the Jackson County Chamber of Commerce. Um, we have uh, continued to uh, try to be a benefit to our members and uh, to be able to have uh, Sarah with us today is a continuation of our attempts to continue to serve our members and provide the needed information. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for being a part of this and those that have joined the, uh, joined the webinar. Um, just a quick introduction uh, for our guest. Um, Sarah was uh, uh, elected to the 65th District of the House of Representatives in November of 2008, um, or two, 2018, I'm sorry. Um, the, the 65th District, just to set some geographical um, elements in your mind, it includes Springport, Tompkins, uh, Blackman, Henrietta, Waterloo, Grass Lake, uh, Liberty Townships in Jackson County, and then you got something in uh, Lenaway up there or down there by Cambridge, and then even something up by uh, Eaton Rapids and Brookfield Townships in, um, in Eaton County. So she's got a wide hunk of our real estate that she's helping us with. Um, so again, Sarah, on behalf of the Jackson County Chamber and our community, I want to thank you for taking time to uh, um, share your thoughts and ideas and feedback and be available to answer our questions. This is great for, for our community. Sarah, I'll throw it to you for some opening remarks and welcome. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all the chamber members uh, listening in and watching uh, today. I'm privileged to be here. Um, I feel honored, actually, uh, to be speaking with you and to be serving for you and be your voice in Lansing. Um, we have been working diligently in Lansing among, um, well, in, at home, basically, uh, with other legislators, our leadership team, um, the best we can with the executive branch in uh, trying to get Michigan safely back open again. Um, you know, we're multiple weeks into this uh, stay at home order. We have, I think, 16 more days um, left of it. And then, you know, we're trying to d devise a plan to safely reopen Michigan, get people back up and running. I know that some people are running at uh, a smaller capacity. Um, and, it, you know, lots of our communities are taking hits right now. And I get it in the name of safety. Um, I think we need to be smart and continue to have good, good practices as far as social distancing, hand washing, all that. Um, that comes along with that. Um, but in the meantime, I just want you guys all to know that, you know, we have been um, trying to expand different areas of the state, obviously, uh, through executive order, unemployment has been expanded. Um, SBM has been a great resource for a lot of businesses, um, especially right now with their PPP program, um, pay paycheck protection program, uh, in case somebody doesn't know what that is. And um, they're taking applications every day for those loans. And, and the interesting thing about that is um, it is a loan. It starts off as a loan, but it does have loan forgiveness. 
And so essentially it's, it's a loan that, you know, will actually kind of turn into a grant. So it's kind of a weird process, um, but I think it's going to be good for our small business owners, especially um, not knowing what it's going to look like when we do reopen Michigan um, and when we continue to open businesses back up again. So in the meantime, I'm just uh, here to answer any questions that I can, um, and I'll do the best I can. And if I don't know, I'll find out. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're going to start off with a question from Fred. Um, Fred's in Jackson. Um, he writes, okay. it is impossible to contact the state of Michigan unemployment agency if a person is unable to complete the information electronically because the site refers to them for an access code to continue the application and the access code is only available by direct phone. How can someone proceed? This number is busy from eight to five every day, uh, more than 100 attempts thus far. How can this be rectified and how soon? Sarah? Sure. Um, well, yesterday, uh, the whole system was down, unfortunately. I don't, I don't know what the cause of that was, but as far as moving forward, they have moved to um, expanding hours. They have added additional employees to be answering the phone. And um, so the hours now are like eight to six. And then I can't, I can't remember Sunday, but it's on the website now. Um, they have expanded broadband or bandwidth, you know, to increase, uh, to be able to take all those increased fall, calls and requests online. And um, as far as the online process, I, I, that one I recommend doing in off hours. Um, unfortunately, I had to sit down at the computer with my brother the other night and, um, you know, went through that process. And we were one of the lucky ones that we got through, got, got it done in like five minutes. The bad part was, is it was 1115 at night. Um, and as far as the phone calls, uh, you can contact my office too. And Tony can help you navigate the UIA uh, system. And my office number is 517-373-1775. Um, you can leave a voicemail and we'll get back with you because we are still working. Um, but I just ask that you be patient. I mean, we have almost a million people applying for unemployment benefits. And as you may know, yesterday was the first day that the um, federal, federal money kicked in. So the other thing I want to mention is for those of you that have already applied, 1099 contractors, um, independent contractors, sole proprietors that are now eligible under the federal um, bill. If you already applied and got a denial letter, don't start a new claim. Just log back into your account and answer some of the questions. They might ask for some additional information, but you know that that is available now. Um, if you haven't filed a claim yet, now is a good time to do it. And I would recommend if you do it online. Do it late in the evening or early, early in the morning, like before 6 a.m. Um, and like I said, just if you have problems with reaching a person for your PIN number, uh, contact my office as well, and we can help you navigate that process. All right. Thanks, Sarah. This from Dan in Liberty Township. Who polices essential services? Well, right now, under the current uh, state of emergency, state of disaster, the governor has pretty much unilateral power. Um, we had asked <clears throat> for some flexibility in that power uh, with the governor and to deem uh, services safe versus not safe, rather than essential versus non-essential. Um, the SISA guidelines uh, have been updated to include a broader uh, width of activities, I guess. Um, and, and we're actually continuing to ask and plead with the governor to expand that to the size of um, standards, the federal standards. Because everything else, you know, I think for the most part, we are following federal guidelines except that one. And that's a real hindrance and a real um, on our livelihood and getting people back out to work. And also, I just think that being essential and non-essential is a negative connotation for people. I mean, basically, it's, you know, the government's way of saying you're worthless. 
and we don't need you. And I, I just don't think that's good for anybody. So I'm looking forward to continuing conversations with the governor because ultimately at this point, it's solely her discretion. Sarah, Joey from Jackson. Will the school start up earlier than normal to cover the lessons lost this spring? So the school situation is ever changing, I think. Um, right now under, under current order, you know, with the school closures, basically the state has allowed flexibility at the local level. Um, it's our ISDs working together. Um, the waiver is out there, you know, to start before Labor Day. There is a suggestion out there to start with a balanced calendar even to help make up some of that time. As far as the days up until, um, you know, the April 13th deadline, um, those, those were forgiven. Um, and it's kind of a moving forward thing. So I think a lot of, of the information will come out at the end of the month. I think the 28th is kind of the date that the ISDs have been given to have some sort of plan to get some of those kids up that might not necessarily have been ready to move on yet. Um, you know, there, there are certain plans that our educators are working on right now. Um, I actually spoke with one of our principals last night on the phone, and, you know, they're trying to work through a plan and answer all these questions for our parents. You know, what happens? What, what, what does my kid do? What happens going into next year? And, you know, I, I think everybody is still trying to work on that. Okay. Just a reminder to our viewers, um, you are able to submit questions to Sarah live. You can go down to the Q&A tab and I'll be able to monitor those and um, uh, hand those off to Sarah. So I invite you to do that. Um, in the meantime, Sarah, um, Paul from Pleasant Lake, under what criteria should the lockdown be lifted? Sure. So I think, you know, the governor had even mentioned some of the criteria she would like to see in her press conference yesterday. And obviously we want to see a decline in, in deaths and cases that are coming in. And I think yesterday was probably one of the first days that one of the big hospitals had more discharged patients than they had patients coming in. So that's a good sign. Um, that's one of the things. Uh, one of the other things is making sure people continue to have best practices, uh, maintain social distancing, and maintain safety protocols. I mean, this, just because we say, oh, we're not in a state of disaster anymore, doesn't mean that that virus goes away. And quite frankly, I think when, when we do open back up, we, we will probably have a spike again. It only makes sense because people are going to be – around other people again and not just your household. So, you know, the criteria was basically to make sure we have um, proper safety protocols, make sure you can work safely, uh, you know, and also implement some OSHA standards as well. And um, yesterday, SBM actually put on a great little blurb about some of the safety practices with their small businesses. And that's been a great resource as well. So if you guys aren't a part of that or haven't utilized it, I would recommend going on the SBM website, Small Business Association of Michigan, um, for some more of those Q&A questions. But ultimately, it's up to the governor what safety guidelines she wants to implement to reopen the government and reopen some business. All right, and speaking of reopening, Sarah, um, what is the plan for reopening the economy. What businesses do you imagine will be open first? How fast do you think we can get these businesses up and running and get back to some degree of commerce normalcy? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think that our idea of normalcy is probably going to be different going forward for months. Um, as far as opening back up, I would expect, you know, May 1st to open up some businesses that can be done so safely. Businesses that might only have a couple employees, you know, that can maintain social distancing and safe, safe practices. Uh, businesses that are, for instance, 
you know, the landscaping business. A lot of those are individual full proprietors or they might have a team of people, but each team has their own truck and their own mower. And quite frankly, you know, when I used to work at a place that hired that done, we never even saw those people only on the mower. They never come up and contact you. They get on their mower and weed whip and do their business and get out of there. So, you know, there's things like that. And there's things in agriculture. I mean, uh, like our greenhouses, even, you know, my local greenhouse where you would normally go get your seeds for planting or your starters or any of that, you know, they have been shut down And Michigan's one of those unique places that you also have to look at the seasons. I mean, as a farmer, I know that we have a short window of time that we have to be able to plant things. Same thing goes with your gardens or anything else. And if you miss that window of time, you're out of luck. So that could potentially not be normal at all. Um, but I think really the biggest thing is even in manufacturing, you, you need to look at the manufacturers who have a plan to maintain social distancing and safe practices, washing hands, washing equipment, all of that not convincing so many people in a small area. So, you know, I, I think as long as uh, individual businesses have plans to work through this and not put people at risk, they should be able to um, start running again. All right. We've got this from Karen in Jackson. Do you think the feds should put more money into the small business loans that PPP and the idle loans, um, should they be refunded by the feds? So there's lots of different things going on with that. I think it's a hard question to answer because um, between the federal government and our state government, you know, trying to invest in business is always a good thing. Um, it's just a matter of what level of, of investment do we do? you know, and what do we put in? And also at the same time, they're asking for millions and millions of, well, billions really of dollars for PPE, uh, you know, for our frontline workers as well. So it's right now, I feel like it's a balancing act between um, providing the resources that are needed to uh, overcome this pandemic and then providing resources to revive our nation and to revive our businesses and our economy um, and get people working and out spending money again. But I think it's going to be a long time coming. And I don't, I just, I don't think there's a good answer for that. I don't, you know, we always say we always want more money for investment in in business and downtowns and, and things like that. But I just don't know the answer to, Sorry, can you guys see me still? Okay, there you are. It You're back, out You're for a minute back. for some reason. Um, but anyways, I just think it, this is a balancing act that our congressional leaders, our president, um, have to have to manage. And in communication with us, I mean, um, I I really can't say. Okay. Um. Sarah, I'm going to put a couple questions together and uh, uh, kind of summarize them a bit. Um, we've got some okay. specific. We've got some specific questions um, asking for guidance on what to do or how to I even initiate the unemployment benefits. For uh, a lot of people, this is their first go around with trying to manage that and work through it. And then we've got some other questions with the technical issues um, uh, about doing that. Um, could you maybe uh, reiterate your phone number and what help you and Tony could be? Sure. Um, so first of all, I think that, you know, in navigating the unemployment, um, they have a phone number you can call and you can also manage it online. Um, and they do have it set up now to um, by last name. So look online, look at the UA, UIA uh, website and you'll be able to find what days um, you can call by your last name. And in the meantime, it, you know, my office can also be a resource 
and my number is 373-1775. Or you can email me at sarahleitner at house.mi.gov. So it's sarahleitner at house.mi.gov or 517-373-1775. Um, but in the meantime, I just ask that you continue to be patient. It is a difficult process as far as um, getting through, but once you're through, it seems to be running pretty well um, from what I've heard. And also that additional money uh, from the federal government is also has, has also kicked in as of this week. So that additional $600. And then um, also if people are um, working less hours, there's the work share program that is working through um, unemployment as well. And the work share program basically will give you the percentage of that $362. So say you're, you're, you've been cut by 50%, so you're only working 20 hours instead of 40 hours, um, you would get half roughly of that 362 as kind of a supplement to you also working. All right, um, we've got a question from Jan and she asked, what do you think about programs that allow people to make more money not working? Yeah, so I have not been a big fan of that. And I've actually spoke with numerous employers, um, even um, just the other day, uh, I spoke with another employer and he said, you know, Sarah, we have safe practices in, in place. We are continuing to work. We still are maintaining our business and maintaining social distancing. Um, but we've had employees call and say, I, I, I'm afraid to come to work. And, you know, it, it puts employers in a tough spot right now um, because of this COVID. And quite frankly, I, from an employer's perspective, I don't really like it. And I mean, when you have frontline workers risking their life and risking their family's lives, um, you know, it's, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I think it's a little excessive to be sitting home and I understand some people don't have that choice and that they do want to work. I've heard from numerous hundreds, thousands probably of people who do want to get back to work. Um, so I, you know, it's one of those things that that was a federal uh, implementation, that additional money. And um, I don't think it should be a resource that you should be able to live on just and sit home. A couple of these uh, questions are going to be summarized um, in um, each of the areas you deal with. We talked about you're up north, you're down south by Lenaway. But whether it's Wayne, Macomb counties, or Jackson County, there's a there's a lot of differences between there. Do you think that the state will reopen in geographic areas with some uh, consideration to those those sorts of things, or do you see us just all opening at once? How how do you see that? I would like to see something like that. I mean. Obviously, the vast majority, super majority of all these cases come from four counties. Um, and I'm not ignorant to the fact that people from those counties aren't going to come to counties like ours to do things, work, visit people. But at the same time, I think that there could be a smarter approach, a more common sense approach to say, look, you know, very little risk here. Let us get back to work in our bubbles, you know, and go ahead and work in that system and and slowly come back online. Um, I would love to see something like that because basically the whole entire state is being punished, you know, for a huge pandemic in one area. And I mean, I know we have it in Jackson County, we have it in Eaton County, but it isn't as prevalent as it is down in Detroit, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb. Um, and so I would definitely like to see a regionalized approach, but ultimately the governor has that unilateral power. So um, I, I can't say. All righty. What, oh, this is from Kevin in Jackson. What could the state have done to been more prepared? Um, 
I think we're learning all of those things right now. Uh, we never would have expected something this big and this fast. Um, I do think that, you know, we were proactive before we left the legislature um, in March to appropriate money and to give discretionary spending to the governor. Um, but there also is a process to emergency declarations. And I, you know, unfortunately ours wasn't signed and sent right away. Um, but that, that's one thing that comes to mind right away. The other one is I, I really think that our manufacturing industry really stepped up and, you know, within days uh, converted over some parts of their factories to produce PPE. And our procurement process, went from public and private right away. And, you know, quite frankly, our director of DTMB for the state of Michigan, I think has done a great job um, with that procurement process and providing uh, additional PPE for our front lines and being prepared. Um, but honestly, I think all the rest of it is, I mean, I, I think that we were sh shut down pretty quickly. I think that proactive measures were taken pretty quickly as far as, you know, uh, limiting people from contacts and gatherings. I mean, I didn't like it, but who does, you know, but I think it was the right thing to do. So, you know, moving forward, I think this, we have a checklist of things that we're going to work towards in case certain pandemics happen like this again. Sarah? A uh, question from Rob in Clark, uh, Clark Lake. Did Whitmer's national bickering with Trump cost us needed supplies? I don't think so. Um, so prior to her national bickering, we had already gotten two supplies from the national stockpile. And um, literally the day that she finally signed the declaration, um, we got another, another additional uh, supply from the national stockpile. Um, but in the meantime, you know, our GTMB procurement uh, department also, you know, was procuring stuff outside of the federal government because going into this, even by the time I think we had our third shipment, and I think we've had five or six now, um, by the time we had our third shipment, we were only at like, Point two, uh, two tenths of a day worth of supply in Michigan at any one time. And I think we're at two to six now in our hospitals. So now more of our locals should be seeing that PPE. It should be a little bit I don't, easier, I guess, to, um, to uh, obtain. All right. Um... We got a question from Brad. He is from Jackson. What do you think about the governor's performance during this COVID mess? Well, I just want to start off by saying I don't envy her position. Um, I don't envy any governor right now in this in this position. One of the things I am disappointed in, though, is, you know, she has the House and the Senate to lean on and to help her through this process. And as a state representative for Jackson, Eaton, and Lenaway counties, I don't think that she's utilizing our voices. Therefore, she's cutting out your voices. So, you know, we represent the 10 million people of the state of Michigan. And granted, you can't have 10 million opinions. I mean, you do, but you can't process that much in a time of crisis and she does need some leniency and some grace during that process but I think that she has the senate in the in the house to say that um you know to ask for suggestions and work with us and I just feel that the communication isn't there and it's just been more of a unilateral decision and um not implementing all parts of uh, the government that they probably should, but that's that's kind of where I'm at with that. I mean, I, I I don't envy her. I'll tell you that. All right, thank you, Sarah. We're hearing from Jimmy. Um, he owns a small 
business, about four people, and or four employees, okay. and never been through anything like this. What would you suggest is his very first step? Because he is not, he's deemed non-essential. And he's, I, I'm reading between the lines here, but I mean, he's just at a loss. This is totally new to him. What would you recommend his first step be? So right now, in the meantime, he said he's a small business, about four people and non-essential. I would seriously consider reaching out to the Small Business Association of Michigan. There are grants, there are loans, there are different programs um, that can help them along to keep them going uh, in this time and then to help plan for in a couple of weeks when we can be back up and running hopefully again. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, that's really the best answer I have right now. All right. Next question. Are you aware of any plan to implement hazard pay or any additional benefits for frontline healthcare professionals? Um, you know, I, I'm not sure right now. I mean, I would be supportive of that. I mean, we have all kinds of frontline professionals that Yep, I get it that they chose the healthcare profession. But right now they're working overtime, they're separated from their families, and they're making lots of sacrifice, sacrifices for the good of the rest of us. And that doesn't go unnoticed in our book. And, you know, we hear from lots of people all the time, but, you know, even, um, you know, the Families First Act where it allows for additional leave time in regards to COVID or additional time to help provide for child care that's out there. I'm supportive of those things, um, especially, you know, for these people, like I said, that are separated. I know that some people are, you know, the grandparents are living with their kids right now because both of them are in the healthcare profession and they don't want to put their family at risk because they're dealing directly with COVID. Um, you know, patients every single day. So I am supportive of that. I'm not quite sure what's going on right now. I know that in other professions that is happening, um, for instance, Department of Corrections has um, implemented, oops, sorry, has implemented um, kind of a hazard pay as well because uh, it's starting to run rampant in the prison. So I would expect something similar for our frontline workers as well. All right, thanks, Sarah. This question come in, is this, are you aware, is the state setting up any sort of forum for business leaders to share how they're keeping their employees safe and have innovative strategies to keep their companies viable? So every single day, and I know I keep referencing the Small Business Association, but Every single day, the Small Business Association does kind of a live stream and questions and answers on, on, on these issues because, you know, there's thousands and thousands of businesses in our, in our um, state, and I would recommend reaching out to them and talking to them about that and just kind of looking on there. I mean, obviously, the Jackson Chamber does different things every single day, talking with different people, bus business leaders. Um, obviously, people like me in government. Um, so, you know, reaching out to the different chambers as well as a resource. Um, I, I probably will put something together. Um, we're looking at an education roundtable uh, forum as well because that's kind of an interesting situation. But um, it's ever fluid situation. And I would just say that I would also be looking into it and I will let you know and I'll let Tim know. And, you know, obviously if you're on the Jackson Chamber right now, you'll see that pop up and we can share that as it comes up. And if it comes up, I'll share it as well. You can uh, look me up on Facebook at State Representative Sarah Leitner. We try to share all of that information for all of our different entities in the state right now as well. Linda asks, what percentage of the total budget of $350 billion goes to SBA PPP program for small business owners? I have heard that the plan is out of money already. 
That's it. Um, let me look here. Hold on. I had a number for some of this. Um, we have an updated White House call tomorrow, actually, and I can give a better number then. But let's see. I really, I don't even see it. I don't see it right now. I can't find it on my notes. There was quite a bit of money, and I know that alludes to the question earlier, you know, could there be more? Probably, but I don't know. And like I said, it's a balancing act. You know, we don't want to throw our country into a recession either over, you know, this pandemic as well. So we have to be careful um, and be smart with the dollars that we currently have. So I'll have to get back with you on that because I know I do have a number, but I'm sure the number will be updated tomorrow when we have our White House call. And uh, I'll get that back to Tim. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Kyle writes, how do you balance lives lost because of a virus and lives lost because of depression, suicide, domestic violence, and an economic recession? Sure. So my husband and I had this conversation last night because we were looking up the amount of people that die in our state every year um, from uh, op opioid abuse, um, suicide in general, prior to this epidemic, car accidents, um, you know, and I don't want to downplay the people that are dying right now. You know, for goodness sakes, one of my own colleagues died a couple of weeks ago from COVID as well. Um, and so, you know, it's tough. It's, it's a weight that all of us are carrying right now. Um, when we have conversations with the governor about being smart and being safe and also knowing that there's still going to be risk. Um, and I think the biggest thing for us goes back to, you know, the plan for reopening safely. You, you have to calculate your risk. And unfortunately, in anything you do, people are going to die. I mean, people die on airplanes also, you know, but we still get on them. You still go on with life. And um, sometimes we just have to pull up our bootstraps and get to work. And um, it's a risky business sometimes, but a lot of us are willing to take that risk. We just have to be smart about it. Sarah Kim um, comments, uh, as a small business owner, I have applied for PPP uh, with MSBA, uh, SBA, uh, over a week ago, and I have not received any correspondence. She's asking for your suggestions. What should I do? Sure. Um, well, reach out to my office, 517-373-1775, um, and we can talk to you more specifically about that. Um, and then help you contact them because obviously, you know, one of my colleagues is married to Brian Kelly. So if I have to use that resource, I will <laughs> to get a response. All right. Yep. Okay. Just one second. Martin yep. asks, how as a society, can we be relying on schools to feed the children? Sure, that is an interesting question. Um, I don't necessarily think it's, I, this is my own personal opinion. My own personal opinion is we should do our best to feed our children, our own children. I think that, you know, doing breakfasts was one of the easy wins schools had in helping kids, you know, making sure no kid child was left behind, no child was hungry coming to school. I get that to help with that. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's something we as parents should just automatically expect our schools to do. I feel like part of people's duty as a parent is to provide for your child. And I get that sometimes resources are tight. Like now, now is an unprecedented time. Now is an unprecedented time for people not to be working. Um, you know, income is low. Unemployment doesn't necessarily cover all the bills. I get that. Um, 
And so I think it's great that if our community is willing to continue to pay for that at this time and pay for those people in need, that we need to, we need to take care of our people. We need to take care of our neighbors. And sometimes if that's in the form of, you know, school lunches, I guess that's what we have to do to take care of one another right now. This question from Jane, do you think the governor is going to extend the stay at home after May 1st? I have no idea. That's the best answer I can give you. Um, it, it, like I said earlier, communication has been kind of one of those things that hasn't been great with this executive branch. And sometimes she indicates one thing and does another. So I hope to God we can lift that order and um, get back to work safely and continue some sort of normalcy. Jerry writes, do you see any value in opening sports teams to play before empty stadiums? You know, quite frankly, you know, sporting events are on the bottom of my list right now, other than our local sports teams. I mean, my son is super disappointed he can't be playing baseball right now. And quite frankly, I think that, you know, sports are – Sorry, my, my phone clicked out for a second. Um, I think a lot of money is dumped into sporting events and, um, you know, celebrities are elevated to a certain pedestal. And I don't necessarily think that's good. Is it entertaining? Yep. Um, provides lots of entertainment for lots of people. And my staff is probably rolling his eyes right now at me because he misses baseball really bad right now. But I, I just think it's one of those things. I guess if they can do it safely, safely and play, but, you know, I think that social distancing is going to be something that continues for a little while longer. And, I mean, I guess it's up to MLB and NBA, but, you know, they're, they have salaries to pay, and I think now's the time to look at that and say, are their salaries really that important, and are they worth so many millions of dollars to play a game? when people are dying. Austin from Parma writes, Sarah, how are you coping with doing your work remotely? <laughs> well, it has been a little bit of a struggle. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a social butterfly. So I love to get out to meet people. You know, I would love to be sitting in your office right now, Tim, quite frankly, with a group of your, uh, of our business owners and, and chatting with you one-on-one -on -one because I'm just, you know, a personable person. Um, so I miss it. It's a challenge, but we're, you know, quite frankly, we are so busy. We are so busy communicating with each other in the state, with my colleagues one-on-one, -on -one, via telephone, via Zoom, and, um, you know, it's it's a little difficult, but we have a farm. So, you know, we have things to keep us busy. Also, when I'm not sitting on the phone or on a Zoom meeting, which quite frankly takes up about 12 hours of my day every single day um, right now. And then, you know, I might have a couple hours for a project here and there, but um, I'm doing okay. I think that, you know, the nicer weather helps. The sunshine always helps. And I'm optimistic that we can start um, moving Michigan back in the right direction safely and getting back to work and getting back to normal. Sarah, it certainly is going to be a uh, interesting fall with elections coming up. Uh, yeah, it's definitely going to be an interesting fall. I'm a little disappointed in our May elections. I think it's, it's not – I just feel like by doing a paper mail-in ballot – um, you know, risk integrity of our election. And um, I would have liked to have seen the May election move to August. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, that was a decision the governor made uh, with Secretary of State uh, Benson. And uh, we'll see how this goes. I mean, it's 
going to be an interesting time also for us campaigning because it's not like people want us at their doors right now either. So you can't be out knocking doors. So the best I can do is Facebook phone calls and, you know, Zoom. Unprecedented times for sure. Um, Sarah, we've taken uh, much longer than our scheduled 30 minutes or what we thought. So we certainly appreciate your willingness to spend such, uh, such time with us. And uh, I'll uh, invite you to close it out with some final words, uh, final words for us. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me today. It's been a pleasure to answer questions and just chat with people. Even though it was only your face I saw, you know, I can't wait to get out and see everybody. And if you have any questions, comments, um, concerns, please feel free to reach out to my office. We are still working. 517-373-1775 is my phone number. And you can reach me via email, sarahleitner at house.mi.gov. Um, and we are checking Facebook. And you can call me on my cell phone or text me as well. Um, I'm available to answer questions. And again, like I said, just contact my office, 517-373-1775. And I appreciate the time that you gave me today. And I hope to see you again soon in person. Well, it certainly was our pleasure. And again, on behalf of our community and our chamber members and the chamber staff here, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to do this and share your insight. And uh, to our participants, those that uh, are part of the webinar chat, um, thank you. Um, we're here busy at the chamber. Um, we uh, consider ourselves essential in regards to keeping up what we're doing for you and helping the best we can to communicate the needed information. And we certainly hope you found uh, this time today valuable. Um, feel welcome to contact us, uh, Facebook, any of our social media platforms. We do have a real good webinar or a uh, uh, page on our uh, website, the COVID tab. So uh, we're still here, we're still active, we're essential for you, we know that, and we're uh, up to that obligation. So. Have a great rest of the day. Be safe, be smart, stay home.